and we are up and running. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Joseph Conlon uh, presenting today's seminar. He would tell us about some moduli stabilization and holographic swampland. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, it's good. Uh, we look forward to hearing. It. Please don't rush off at the end. We tend to taper out, and we don't. We're not very strict with the timekeeping at the end. Okay. Uh, th thanks so much, Dave. Joan, th thanks very much for the in invitation to give give, the, give this talk. Even that you know, it's not quite the same as that actually being in Ireland, but it's um, it's, it's still it's uh, it's still it's still very nice. Hopefully, you can visit. Okay, so, your so I want to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You can't even go out your counties at the moment, can you? Or... <laughs> yes, but our, our visitor yeah, so... budget is, is, is excellent at the moment. <laughs> our <laughs> seminar budget. A bus to the edge of Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so, so let's talk about yeah, modular stabilisation in the holographic swamp. So this is kind of about yeah, so a set of ideas in terms of kind of string theory and string compactifications and about how you can kind of you know, try and rule in or rule out um, ideas on kind of on effective Lagrangians and whether or not they are consistent with uh, quantum gravity. Okay, so I suppose I want to start talking a bit just generally in terms of general introduction about kind of what moduli are, um, at least my kind of perspective as someone who's kind of interested in you know, how you connect string theory to observable physics, kind of why are they interesting and and why they are kind of you know, nice things to think about if you're interested in how you connect string, string theory to more observable physics. So you're, so you're starting from the kind of perspective of, you know, what are the ultimate laws of nature? So we know we've got GR, we know we've got the standard model, we know we've got other stuff beyond that, and which I've de denoted by, as the BSM Lagrangian. We don't quite know what's in the BSM Lagrangian, what particles are there, what interactions are there, but I think it's you know, pretty fair to say that we know it is there. And one of the sort of simplest and I think kind of best motivated ideas for one of the elements of what is in the BSM Lagrangian are moduli, you know, so are massive scalars which only have kind of gravitational or gravitationally suppressed couplings to ordinary matter. You know, so we have particles that just interact with the strong interactions, we have ones that just interact electromagnetically, ones that only interact weakly, and it's kind of reasonable that there's stuff which interacts under none of these and interacts only through kind of gravitationally suppressed, suppressed couplings. An example of such a gravitational suppressed coupling is one five M Planck F mu nu F mu nu. This doesn't have to be, you know, interacts via exchanges of the graviton, but it, can, but it just means interactions that are suppressed by the Planck scale. And such moduli are kind of rather well motivated from, for example, from extra dimensional theories or string theory. And this is because it's something like string theory, which starts in 10 dimensions. You know, you can use such moduli as like the extra dimensional modes of the graviton. That if the graviton is initially in 10 dimensions, then the modes which are going to prop the graviton where it are po polarized along the extra compactified dimensions. From the point of view of four dimensions, these look like scalars. And these are scalars that, because they are morally originate as extra dimensional gravitons, they have gravitational strength couplings. And so if you kind of think that extra dimensional theories really are true and that the universe at a fundamental scale really does have, you know, 10 dimensions or 11 dimensions, then it's very reasonable to think that in our four dimensional Lagrangian, there is in the BSM part of it, some massive scalars which have a gravitationally suppressed couplings to ordinary matter. So let's just elaborate a bit more about where they, where they come to really come from in string theory. So, String theory is a theory of kind of dynamical geometry. It's a theory where the extra dimensions are dynamical, whereas you have a 10-dimensional theory, which you then reduce to a four-dimensional one by compactifying, often on, on a kalabi yau space. And the geometry of these extra dimensions, the ones which sort of you know, describe the parameterize the kalabi yau, so how big the kalabi yau is, what shape it is, so these are often the Kähler and co complex structure moduli. And so these are all, and there are many other kinds of deformations, you can have deformations associated to bundle moduli, to brain moduli, and so on. And these correspond in four dimensions to the scalar, these massive gravitational capital scalars, the moduli. And 
if you don't give them a potential, they are phenologically disastrous. This is because if they are light, if they have no potential, they are light and they would be massless. And these would lead to fifth forces, they can lead to varying couplings, and all they can also lead to decompactification. That if you have an unstabilized field whose tendency is to make the extra dimensions larger, then it's, it's got an ability to run away and leading you to a 10 dimensional vacuum. And so if you care about connecting string theory to the observable physics, and much of my career has been about how do you connect string theory to observable physics, then you have to develop potentials for these moduli fields that fix the geometry, that give these scalars a mass, that fix them at particular vefs. And this is also important because it gives you a vacuum. It gives you a vacuum in which, in principle, you can compute a low energy Lagrangian, and you can look at the fields you have, the interactions, and you can start asking yourself what phenomenology this leads to. Another reason for caring about moduli is that if you want to kind of connect to new physics, one of the best possible ways to do this is, you know, one of the inflation is one of these, you know, one of these ideas which we think is probably true, but what underlies it, we don't really know. But what we do know is that most models of inflations are driven by scalar fields. And scalar fields are, moduli are excellent candidates for infl the inflaton. They're excellent candidates because they are scalars, they have to roll, they have a potential, they couple, they, they, they couple to everything. So this is a more, you know, for maybe, for, you know, phenological bottom-up reason for thinking about moduli rather than the top-down one. You know, the top-down one was to say, you know, string theory, you know, we think string theory is true, therefore, the bottom-up one is to say that there is reasonably clear evidence of scalar fields in the universe. The Higgs is the scalar field we know about. You know, inflation is another good reason to think about scalar fields. So scalar fields are, as parts of nature, are rather well motivated. Another reason where moduli are important, why, why you should care about them, so this is the sort of general advert for why moduli matter, is if you think about the early universe. So one of the features of the early universe, we talk about the hot big bang, but the hot big bang is a radiation dominated era. And one of the sort of first things one learns in cosmology is that the radiation, the matter is that stuff redshifts in different ways. The particular matter redshifts as one over a cubed, whereas radiation redshifts as one over a to the four. And what this means is that in a context between matter and radiation in an expanding universe, matter will tend to win. And so if you do have matter that's around, it will come to dominate over any radiation that's there. And in particular, if you have stable matter, the matter will dominate until at such point as it decays to, to, to initiate the hot big bang. And the weaker the couplings, the longer the lifetime. So this is a point where so normally you say the stuff that's only couples gravitationally is least important, but the early universe is the point where it's actually most important because the more weakly it's coupled, the longer it lives. And the longer it lives, the longer you get this uh, matter dominated epoch before it ultimately decays, giving rise to the hot big bang. And so if you have like a 10 TeV gravitationally coupled scalar, then it won't decay until basically the onset of the Big Bang nuclear synthesis. And so the early universe would then be very much moduli dominated. So these are, these are sort of phenological reasons to care about moduli and why they are, what's that described as kind of ev everyone's business. Yeah, that if, you, if you're coming from a fundamental theory attitude, then string theory will almost always give rise to them. And even if you just care about phenology, then yeah, there are many situations where scalar fields are what matters. Okay, um, any questions on you know, the, the motivations for moduli in the first place before I talk a little bit about moduli stabilisation? No, I think we're okay with that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things then that the in-string theory one needs to do is to construct um, potentials for the moduli. And this is an area which has seen much work over the last decade and a bit. Basically, how do you construct potentials for the scalar fields? How do you stabilise the geometry and find a stable minimum? And examples of these are kind of KQLT or the large volume scenario, which I will talk about a bit more. And then for an interest in phenology, you want to then study the dynamics of these with regards to how supersymmetry is broken. Like what's the part of the particle physics? What's the property of the, of the low energy vacuum we live in now? 
And then also in terms of the dynamics of these potentials, in particular in terms of cosmology, both in the early universe, where you could have an inflationary epoch, and also in the late universe, where you could have a stable De Sitter universe. Okay, now here's, yeah, modular stabilization is a bit, is a big topic in itself. So here the general, um, the, sort of the general thing about yeah, how it tends to be done is to follow this kind of effective field theory logic. Now, the aim at the bottom of this is to get kind of a vacuum, but, but it doesn't, you know, you don't start by solving the whole kind of quantum corrected, to, quantum corrected string theory. Instead, you know, starting with string theory, one, one of these one goes to kind of an effective field theory, the idea that something describes 10 dimensional supergravity. This is then dimensionally reduced to give you a four dimensional supergravity where you've got a Kähler potential, a super potential for the moduli and matter fields. If you've got fields that are particularly heavy, you integrate them out to get a further effective field theory for the lighter fields. And then finally, in this effective field theory, you then find the, sorry, the potential of it and find the minimum of the vacuum, the minimum of this potential. And so this is using the ordinary language of effective field theory, using the ordinary ideas of effective field theory, that you want to work in regions of weak coupling, you want to work in regions of weak string coupling, you want to work in regions of large volume to try and control alpha prime corrections. And so it's an order, you know, you integrate out heavy modes. You know, it's the ordinary language and logic of effective field theory. And I think it's a good language and logic, but it is open to the criticism of saying that how do you, you know, how do you really know that the result is correct. I mean, you, you know, you're not solving, starting with the original string theory. You, instead, you're working through these kind of steps of dimensional reduction and effective field theory. And in the recent years, so the, one of the, way, the ways, in the last few years, one of the ways this has been kind of criticized, or maybe, or maybe not criticized too strong, maybe kind of an alternative perspective, is the idea of the swamp land. Of, of the swamp land. And the swamp land kind of set, tries to make, it, make some various very bold statements about saying perhaps there are no decisive vacuum in string theory. Perhaps the ADS vacuum, you cannot have any non-supersymmetric non ADS vacuum. Perhaps the slopes of potentials have to be, show a certain amount of steepness, so you can't have things like slow roll inflation. And while I think it's fair to say, you know, a lot of these swamp line conjectures, there is not strong, more, you know, definitive arguments for, or maybe there's not strong definitive, you know, they, they, they have the, the, the benefit of kind of stimulating trying to try and think in an alternative way rather than you know, to try and think, oh, could there be some deep reason why some of these approaches or constructions are, are wrong? And so this is kind of where this work is situated. So what I want to do is I want to talk now a bit more particularly about some particular thing, for example, of modular stabilization, and then think about, well, can one use holographic techniques to try and to try and analyze whether kind of this is consistent or or not consistent. Okay, so the particular example of modular stabilization I'm going to talk about is the large volume scenario. So this is something that um, I came up with together with um, Vijay Balasubramaniam, Herbert, and Fernando Covado about 15 years ago. And the nice thing, it, the nice thing it does is to, that it stabilizes the extra dimensions at kind of exponentially large values. And the reason this is interesting is because if you have a very large volume, then you've got a way of getting of getting at hierarchies. So if you're interested in a kind of phenological side of string theory, then this is good because it gives you a way of of generating of generating hierarchies. So I won't talk. Yeah, you know, I won't. The, the sort of the substructure kind of flux impactifications and the unperturbed effects and alpha prime corrections. I'm not going to sort of particularly talk about here this because in this seminar I kind of really want to think about more of a, of, a, of a holographic side. Well, okay, by large volume, uh, Joseph, you are thinking of the spa four dimensional space time being large. Oh, so the six dimensional space, but so, so, so normally with the six dimensional space, you know, when people talk about it being large, what they mean is it like it's, you know, 10 times the string scale, or, you know, the, the volume is kind of 10 in string units. But here the volume can be like 10 to the 15 in string units or 10 to the 20 in string units. Okay. And, and why this is interesting is because both it kind of it lowers the string scale, so the effective string scale moves down from the Planck scale of 10 to the 18 Jev, and it can move down to like 10 to the 10 Jev, for example. And it also greatly lowers the scale of supersymmetry breaking. 
Okay, so this, these are quite large uh, uh, Kaluza Klein type spaces that you relative to Planck scale. Relative to this, they're large relative, relative to the to our, scale. Quite small, still relative to our scale. Yes, relative to us, they're still very small. They're still they're still extremely small relative to us, but they're rather large relative to the string scale, to the fundamental scale. And so, so one reason why this is interesting is, you know, is that because it's kind of the volume gets to be ra rather large, well, both this generates interesting hierarchies, but it also enables you to kind of have a good separation, separation of scales. So if you want to ask principled questions about are these, are such compactifications consistent? Is the effective Lagrangian consistent? It simplifies many of the pr problems because it reduces things to effective field theories where you've got a clear, demarcation of scales and so the whole integration out procedure is very clear it's very clear what are the light modes and what are the and what are, and what are the heavy modes okay so i'm just going to say describe what the kind of um the effective field theory you you get here so the nice thing about this construct is that you end up with and then i'm going to talk about kind of yeah the sort of the hol holographic questions i want to ask okay so the nice thing about this is that you end up with a, you have a potential, you end up with a potential to, which has just got, the light fields are just an overall volume, which is, this is an overall breathing mode of the, of the space. So this is the space, this mode that describes the overall kind of radius, if you like, of the extra dimensions. So you've only got, you've got that field and you've got an axiom that's kind of part of the same supermultiple with respect to it. But then, and then all the other stuff is kind of all the other fields to, tend to be kind of much heavier. So your effective field theory only contains a small number of fields. And this is in contrast to, you might think with Calabi hours often of hundreds of moduli. And if so, and, and so you can have a hundred fields that are all kind of present at the same time in the effective field theory. But what's kind of nice about this setup is you don't, you've only got a rather small, small number of fields that are in the effective field theory. And with this effective field theory, so you've got, you've got a potential, you've got a, kinetic terms so you can solve for the minimum to obtain the, the where the vacuum is and you can expand about it and then you've got an effective theory expanding about that that minimum okay so this is the kind of yeah i've been rather kind of quick on this but this is so because but one thing i kind of because it's because the details of, of how you get here don't really matter so much for this book this book this Talk. I mean, the point is that yeah, this so we we have a scenario of moduli stabilization, and it's leading us to a particular effective Lagrangian about ADS space. And the question this kind of talk is about is that are there ways we can tell whether or not this Lagrangian is consistent? If there are changes that we do to it which we know are clearly inconsistent, can we pick up on this? And because it's an ADS space, then we hope we can use holographic ideas, the holographic ideas of ADS CFT. To, to think about this. Okay, so I appreciate that for most of the, this kind of bit of the talk has probably has probably been been quite quick. They, so, but so the kind of questions people want to ask about to help just sort of clarify where this sits in or things I can help with right at the moment. I think you mentioned like a couple of slides ago about some kind of geometry of uh, of your picture. Can you elaborate? So what is? Um... Yes. Okay. So this is so if you have a, a string, so we have a string yeah, geometric origin, right? So what is the origin? Maybe I just I didn't pick up. Yeah. yeah. So we have a so if we have a string compactification, so then we have the split into the four dimensions and the six dimensions. And so the the six dimensions, you know, the six dimensional space, you know, will have a so has associated to it kind of string modes, KK modes, and other moduli. But then, so the, if you make the if if you are able to stabilize in a way that the volume of the six dimensional space is rather large compared to the fundamental scale, then you've got a clear splitting between the, for example, the scale of the KK modes and the scale of the string modes. Between the scale of the KK modes and the scale of the of the light of the light moduli, whereas if the volume is rather close to unity in, in string units, then the 
the KK modes and the modulo modes and the string modes are all rather similar, similar to each other. Is that an answer or is that? Yeah, but uh, what, what kind of metric do you consider in each, in each uh, case? A metric on the internal space. Yeah. So it's a, it's a club, yeah. Ah, okay. So you, <laughs> this, this was my question. So sorry, very sorry. Good, yeah. And it's a, so with these, it's, it's kind of originates from all these kind of collabial yeah, flux compactifications. So the fluxes kind of deform things slightly, but the, the larger the volume, the less the deformation is. So you know, if you have these very large volumes, you basically, it's just the metric is pretty much pure collabial yeah, up to row, rather small corrections here. And then this, when the volume mode is then the overall breathing mode of the collabial. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I, I missed uh, where you, you have a very specific form for your potential with a, an exponent of three halves. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is the bit, I mean, where on some level I'm kind of asking you to, to accept this because, you know, so this is the kind of the large volume scenarios which has become, you know, and this is originating in our, uh, let me go back to see. Okay, so what's underlying it is this scalar potential and the, this super potential, which where you, if you've got a Calabi-Yau with kind of what is called the Swiss cheese structure, where you've got some small blow-up cycles and a larger calabi -Yau. And so I'm basically asking you to accept that, you know, if you study this supergravity theory, it, it has a minimum, which is at exponentially large volumes. That's not an obvious point, but because it's, you know, this has now become a rather standard scenario, um, I'm, I'm asking you to kind of just accept that as a result. Okay, so you are, you are assuming supergravity survives to this large scale, or that supersymmetry survives to this large scale. So this is the sort of the, um, the dimensional reduction thing that, you know, the, with the, when the volume is very large, the gravitino mass, which is giving you a measure of the supersymmetry breaking scale, you know, is much, much lower than the Planck scale. Okay, all right. And so this is part of what go, why going to a large volume gives you good hierarchies, because it also automatically lowers the scale of supersymmetry breaking. Excellent, okay, all right. Yeah. And that's because the gravitino mass is basically given by e to the k over two times w, and so e to the k over two gives you a one over volume factor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the volume is large, the gravitino mass is always low. And the exponent three halves comes naturally then? The exponent, that exponent three half in this potential is not, is not obvious. Okay. It, right. it comes out, there's, there's, it, there's an interplay between two fields, and you win integrating out the heavier one, gives this potential of a power the power of three halves to the lighter one. Okay. Yeah. And the reason I want to kind of basically just jump to the potential is I, is I really kind of want to focus the talk on the question of kind of, given it's an ADS minimum, if we look at this holographically, can we tell whether some perturbations are consistent or not? And I would just run out of time if I tried to derive this to start with. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, so now in terms of, okay, so then, so what this modular stabilization you know, leads to is it leads to a minimum of ADS and with a potential. So, so this means that we've got um, scalar fields, we've got an ADS vacuum, if it's minimum true, we've got an ADS vacuum with fields which have, about, which have interactions. And so this means we can, we can then try and think about this holographically using the ADS CFT um, dictionary. And this tells us that, yeah, so, so we're going to basically assume we can use this and see what, um, that we can get something interesting from it. And this tells us that the, the, the would correspond to have dual operators and the dimensions of these operators are then set by the mass of the fields and how they are relative to, to the ADS scale. And so in the limit where the kind of volume goes very large, um, equivalently, equivalently the, the ADS radius also goes very large, we can basically classify modes into kind of three groups. The ones that in this limit would be kind of become very heavy, which would basically have extremely large conformal dimensions. Ones that would be very light, in which the conformal dimension would go to three because the m squared goes to zero. Or ones where the conformal dimension goes to a number that is um, around, around one. Okay, now here in, in LVS, so what we have is that almost all the modes are heavy. So these are things like they're all, not just the closed modes, but most of the moduli end up as what I call heavy. 
the modes which are kind of a light are only the graviton and the over the axion associated to the overall volume and the one would be interesting would be one associated to the overall overall volume modulus and so this is kind of interesting because so one reason i think this is nice is because most of these modulized stabilizations i just need you to a kind of a very large number of fields so then if you wanted to kind of ask questions about what they view like come look like holographically well you'd be left with some just number of hundreds of fields across one year you know, some hundreds some hundreds of operators and you wouldn't have any kind of very, very sharp statement one thing that's interesting about lvs as a modular stabilization scenario that isn't, isn't true that if you say what would this correspond to from a cft side of this well you know the string compactification would give you an ads4 minimum if you translate this into cfd data what you would have is that you know in this limit of large volumes you would have rather precise values for the conformal dimensions so the operator dual to the overall volume has would have a conformal dimension which is three halves on one plus square root 19 and the one dual to the graviton and to the axiom would have a conformal dimension of three so in the um so this is well i think this is nice because this would then be yeah the viewed the ones well one sometimes thinks about compactifications as, as having like a an enormous number of possibilities. We can talk about a landscape of possibilities of you know, 110 to the 500 possibilities. But viewed from this perspective, you know, this leads this. There's a yeah. This, there's there's a rather this this would the, the large volume scenario gives you basically a rather a very limited and specific theory. Yeah, in that the conformal dimension of something dual to the volume modulus is basically is basically fixed. Okay, so this is. Um, I think attractive is then a basis for then thinking about certain swampland questions. So the swampland question is really kind of, you know, you have your proposed ADS theory. Is it consistent? And how can you tell whether, whether it's consistent? So because what we'd have is something that would be dual to basically a rather well-defined um, CFT, and in principle, the kind of the higher point interactions and the potential um, would give rise to yeah, three point and three point and four point and so on functions in the functions in the CFT. Then we can ask some questions about perturbations to this Lagrangian that we would know are clearly in the Swartland. Okay, so here I want to kind of pick up you know, on the Swartland. So, so here's something which it looks consistent about the Lagrangian as it is, and we're going to then modify in a way that's inconsistent. Okay, so as I said, this is a Lagrangian of two fields, a, a scalar modulus and then a cross a partner axiom. And one of the things that you basically have, you know, all string compactifications, they've always been studied, the one thing they all basically always give rise to is axiom decay constants that are less than the Planck scale. That you don't get parametri parametrically transplankian axiom decay constants. And this is the axiom decay constant you can get from the kinetic term for the axiom field and this is also this appears here that as phi goes larger and larger as you approach a de the decompactification limit this is the limit where you can control things the kinetic term gets smaller and smaller and you can see this because i've highlighted in red so it's e to the minus phi over n planks so as phi gets very large which is heading towards the decompactification limit then the axiom decay constant gets gets smaller and smaller it gets parametrically sub -plankian. Okay, and this is what you expect in ordinary string compactifications. Okay, but there's an easy sort of change, a small change we can make to this. So I'm going to take the same theory, where I've got a potential for a scalar and then a massless axiom which just has a kinetic term, and I'm going to change that minus sign to a plus sign. So now in the kinetic term, instead of having e to the minus phi over m Planck, I've got e to the plus phi over m Planck. And this is the property that as phi gets larger and larger, the axiom decay constant also gets larger and larger. And indeed, as would phi would, would as phi gets larger and larger, this would turn into something that is then parametrically transplankian. So this so, coupling is then. Yeah, yeah. So what is choosing the sign of psi by? It's the potential, the exponential minus in the potential. Is that so, what it is? No. So it's the red. So you see. So it's the red in the. So no, the I, no, I understand. But. But if I look at the L kinetic, it looks like yeah. it's got a phi. Without that potential, it looks like it's a phi to minus phi potential. But you have chosen the sign of phi, that positive phi. So, so the idea that changing it, changing it to positive phi 
we'll be doing something that, that we know is inconsistent. Okay, I see. Yeah, so we, that we have a Lagrangian we think is consistent and say, well, there's a modification we can do to it that we know that based on everything we know about string compactifications is inconsistent. But by itself, if you're just given this theory as an effective theory, there's nothing that actually particularly goes wrong with it. It's got a potential, it's got a minimum. And, you know, what's, and these kinetic terms, nothing actually looks wrong about these kinetic terms. So this is, um, so this is why, I'm, so this is an example of a modification, so this is a, when you have a low energy Lagrangian, it's a modification to the Lagrangian that is, that from what we know about string theory is an inconsistent modification. But from the point of view of just looking at the Lagrange, Lagrange, you know, it's hard to say, to try and say what is actually wrong with it. And so what I want to say is then, can we kind of think about this from a holographic perspective and see if we can try and understand, um, you know, or does this correlate to something in the C from the CFT perspective that, that does making this change to an inconsistent theory correlate with a particular change we can identify from a CFT perspective? If we think about this, these are theories on ADS. Okay, any questions at this point? Let me just pause for a moment. I think it's okay. Yeah. I, I, I would have written it as the exponential of minus mod phi. I think that was my confusion. So you have the you have the modulus of phi, and uh, because you have you're insisting that phi is positive. Yes, yeah, so phi is the phi, microscopically phi is like log of the volume. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it can, phi, phi can only be positive because it because the val the value of phi corresponds to the log of the overall vol of the compactification volume. Okay. So now just ex expanding on that a bit. So if given the potential, given the potential, so we had the potential, so you can expand the potential about the minimum and to, to develop a set of kind of endpoint interactions. So you've got the endpoint self interactions of the volume modulus, and then you've also got mixed interactions of the volume modulus with his axiom partner. And these higher point interactions um, will correspond to or determine a three and higher point correlators within any, kind, within any dual, dual CFT. And like I said about um, modifying the sign of the exponential gives you a theory that you basically know is in the swampland. So in terms of these higher point interactions, this modified sign in the exponent, as we expand the exponent out to the power series, is equivalent to taking the theory shown on this slide, and in particular the kinetic terms, and replacing the minus square root eight over three that is in the kinetic terms and replacing that to plus square root eight over three. And so this would co correspond to basically perturbing, perturbing the um, CFT, the CFT theory that we would have and perturbing the higher point interactions. And like I said, so this is a perturbation that we know on the basis of string compactifications is something that belongs to the swampland. And we want to say, you know, is there something we can kind of map onto in the CFT to try and understand what this might, might correlate with, with the idea of seeing is there a more fundamental and rigorous way of establishing which theories are in the swampland and which are not. Okay, so let me just phrase what the problem is then. The problem is that we have with an ordinary string compactifier, with the one we think we think is kind of correct, then this gives you an ADS Lagrangian. We can map this onto a CFT. So this would be a generalized three field theory plus some corrections. We can do a small perturbation to this Lagrangian that we're confident puts us in the swampland. And this then gives us a swampland theory. And so the question is then where does the difference lie? And can we correlate any properties of the CFT with this change from uh, going from a consistent theory to a swampland theory? Right. Okay, so then let's try and think about what these properties could be. Okay, so three-point interactions in the ADS theory, um, they relate to three-point structure functions in CFT on the, on the holographic dictionary. 
And sines of three point functions are not determined. And this is because if you do a field redefinition from you know, phi to minus phi, then a three point function just obviously just, just flips sine, can flip sine on such redefinitions. And so the sine of a three point function by itself I mean, isn't the thing that really carries the physical meaning. But what so and this will which will be things like anomalous dimensions. But so let me just talk a little bit about what the the uh, equations for the three point functions are, first of all. Okay, so so we have a Lagrangian, we're expanding about an ADS vacuum. So we've got a scalar and we've got the axiom. So the couplings are this three point coupling of the scalar with itself, and then also a coupling between the scalar and two axioms. So we're just focusing here on the, the, th the three-point couplings rather than the, rather than the sim simplicity, we're just focusing here on the three-point couplings rather than the higher ones. And then interpreted from a CFT perspective, inter you know, for the language of kind of the, the three, or what would be a 3D C dual CFT, these would correspond, these couplings in the ADS theory correspond to these given structure constants for the, for the CFT. And as I said, the, you know, the three-point functions by themselves are not determinate because if you look at the, especially the three-point function, you know, you flip phi to minus phi, then both of these would, would flip sine. So the, three, the sine of the three-point function by itself is not determinate. But what is determinate are anomalous dimensions, or in, in particularly the anomalous dimensions of the double trace operators in the CFT. So these are uh, the operators you get from basically putting together two of the, if you like, the one particle operators. And they've got, uh, they've got an equivalent formalism in terms of the binding energies of two particle states in, in ADS. And the anomalous dimensions can be related, you know, in terms of what they are, how to determine them, they can be related to the Mellon amplitudes of the CFT. And the Mellon amplitudes in a CFT are, are in kind of, C the, Mellon, the Mellon amplitudes are the kind of analog on ADS space of what uh, Feynman diagrams or Feynman amplitudes are in Minkowski space. And they can, the nice thing about them is that they can be computed in a sort of, sort of similar fashion with kind of a set of, a bit like Feynman rules. And the way that you have Feynman rules in position space, you can use similar rules to work out the minimal amplitudes in, for a, in ADS space. And so they, they, and they have a sort of natural, they can be naturally associated to these um, CFT crops of correlators. And so when computing these Mellon, di Mellon amplitudes, um, there are various sub diagrams you, you sum over in the same way you do for Feynman diagrams. The, ru the rules aren't quite the same, but one thing it does turn out is that the, so the almost dimension has this kind of interpretation as a binding energy of a two particle state in ADS. And if you think about what a binding energy is, that if you've got well separated particles, the binding energy is something that comes through kind of exchanging things between them. And so this means that it's, it's the T-channel diagrams, i.e. the exchange diagrams, that contribute to the contribute to the, the anomalous dimensions, rather than, for example, the, the S-channel diagrams, which are the kind of annihilation style diagrams. And so here's an expression for then what the, the anomalous dimension is for this kind of mixed double trace operators where you take the, an operator corresponding to the volume modulus and also an operator corresponding to the axiom. And what this then relates to is then you've got the, the individual three point functions and then you've got these various, various gamma factors that are basically associated to the, just the structure of kind of ADS space and CFT. And these enormous dimensions are then equivalent, as I said, to the binding energies of the two particle states in, in ADS. Okay, so right, where's this going? Okay, so what it turns out to be interesting is that, so with the kind of, you know, the theory we think is consistent, the theory which is the right one, the theory where we haven't fiddled with science to give us an inconsistent theory, then what you get is you get, uh, you get, you get negative anomalous dimensions for the, 
for the, these, the double trace operators. Whereas if you kind of flip the signs to take you to the Swampman theory, you then get positive enormous dimensions. So I go back to the original Lagrangian to just kind of write, okay, so this was our, the interactions and the, the plus is the, that red plus is the sign of going to the Swampman theory, whereas the minus would be the theory we think is consistent. And the, and this is a change being done on the ADS Lagrangian, and the physical thing it seems to change from the CFT is then the sign of the of the anomalous dimensions. For these for the, the double trace operators, and again something which is um, which is interesting. I don't know whether it means anything, but it's a little bit interesting. Is that in LVS the the anomalous dimension is you know the for the dimension for the volume modulus is only just on the side of having a negative anomalous dimension. Um, the dimension of the volume modulus is about 8.03 and this the expression here for the anomalous dimension changes sign at um, a, a conformal dimension of, of 8. So whereas the conformal dimension for the volume modulus is 8 point, by roughly 8.03. And this is something, okay, so I, even though I was talking about so L, so LVS is the kind of a lot of the large volume scenario is a particular scenario of moduli stabilization. But it's something we also found true for other scenarios of moduli stabilization, such as KK, the KKLT scenario, the racetrack scenario, or other models of perturbative stabilization. That in, in all these cases, it seemed that you know, having the right signs for these uh, three, three point couplings would, from a CFT perspective, correspond to having um, negative anomalous dimensions for these mixed double trace operators. Whereas if you make changes to put yourself in a Swampman theory, then you would instead have positive anomalous dimensions. Okay, so this is um, something which definitely seems, seems, seems interesting. You know, does it mean anything? You know, is this a way of telling whether a certain scenario of moduli stabilization is in the Swampland or not? Okay, well, this is, I'm not sure. Um, so one thing you could say is that to some extent this you so one argument you could make is to say that okay what does you know, what does positive or negative anomalous dimensions what do they mean physically? Well, a negative anomalous dimension is equivalent to having like when you've got a two particle state in ADS that this is kind of bound, and that if you're what you're dealing with here are is the volume modulus and the volume modulus is morally an extra dimensional graviton, and extra and gravitons are kind of you could say are universally attractive. So one could say that maybe what's going on is that the reason you're always, one always in the kind of consistent theory gets the negative anomalous dimension is that it's reflecting that gravity is, univers is universally attractive. And this theory, you know, these moduli stabilization scenarios are then are kind of focusing on the overall volume modulus. But so, yeah, so, so, let, me, so let me sort of say, yeah, that that's, you know, whether it's, Deep or not, I'm not sure, but yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly, it's certainly interesting. There's another connection one can make to what's called the refined distance in conjecture. So this is the statement that if you move fields through um, a Transplankian distance in field space, then you get a tower of states coming down. Yeah, having a tower of states coming down is equivalent to saying that the fields are going to become, the fields become, things like the KK modes become lighter as you move through large distances in field space. And this is again equivalent to the sign of coupling, that as the modulus moves through, the coupling of the volume modulus to the mass term of these fields has to be that the mass figure then becomes lighter as you move in the direction of increasing volume. And so this is also actually gives the same effect that this, this, the distance conjecture also fixes the signs of three point functions. And it's the same way that it results in kind of negative anomalous dimensions for mixed double tracks operators. Okay, so let me just sort of get, let me say, um, this is the, then the kind of where the, where the kind of conclusions are. Okay, so the kind of question the talk about and this research is about asking is, is there ways, if you've got these string compactification scenarios, is there ways of telling whether or not the, the theory is consistent and ways of delineating theories that are in the swampland from theories that are in the, lands, that are in the landscape? And one thing that we seem to find was that as you take a theory that appears to be consistent and then make some deformations to it in a way that you're pretty confident based on all that you know about string compactifications, it puts it in the, in the swamp land, 
then one of the things this seems to do is to turn the sign of the anomalous of dimensions in the CFT from negative to positive. Now the caveats on this is that it could, these could be just a feature of the volume modulus because like I said, the volume modulus is morally an extra dimensional graviton. And you can say that this is morally universally attractive. It's also true at that kind of a more recent work, which is looking at sort of slightly more um, complicated scenarios involving fibre Calabi yells. Um, this doesn't necessarily, where you've got kind of multiple fields contributing to the volume. So rather than just having kind of one field parameterizing the overall volume, you've got kind of several of them in there. And so the one can get larger and another smaller while keeping the overall volume the same. That it doesn't quite seem, doesn't seem, doesn't seem quite seem to hold for these. So whether or not this is saying something deep or whether it's something that's just associated to the, the overall volume modulus, um, I'm not sure, I think it's a matter of kind of um, yeah, future, future work and, and, an open, and an open question. Okay, so I think that's kind of what I wanted to say. Um, so let me kind of, you know, so that that's the end. And there's questions you kind of then want to ask to kind of clarify these things or ask about various aspects of it, um, please do so. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Uh, the floor is open to questions. Uh, can I ask one simple Please, one? Please, Ruga. Uh, well, I'm a little confused about the well, a, a basic point, like uh, since the original motivation is to study um, for the phenomena such, such as the uh, uh, inflation, but uh, you are using ADS CFT correspondence. Uh, okay, so, okay, so yeah, good question. Okay, so what I would say is that you know when people do things like inflation and string theory, almost all these constructions they start with these moduli stabilization scenarios that often sit in often naturally lead to ADS vacua, but then you might be using kind of some part of the potential which is you know in de sitter. Which but then subsequently, you know, which then subsequently rolls down to something. So the, so the potentials people use in inflation <coughs> are using the, the kind of all the ingredients of these moduli stabilization scenarios. So one of the things you might want to know is, you know, are these scenarios basically fundamentally consistent? Yeah, you know, are these, you know, when people, you know, the sitter is kind of harder than ADS. Mm -hmm. And if these scenarios don't work in, you know, when they're just leading to ADS vacua, you know, why should you why should you trust them at all about um, when they when, when people are using them with kind of infl inflationary applications? Uh, okay, okay, I see. Okay. So it's more about kind of you know, can you test these approaches of dimensional reduction and generating potentials from four D n equals one supergravity? Mm -hmm. As that as that is the, basically the, the tool that is used when people do like say inflation reconstructions in string theory. Okay, uh, thank you. Other questions? We have plenty of time for questions. If anyone wants them. Does anyone want to jump in? Maybe I, maybe I can ask, you've just given us one brief test. Do you have others that you can uh, point to? So, it, it, so what it, it, this is kind of trying to explore, because it says, so, this, so even there's been a huge amount of work on ADS-CFT, there's been kind of really very little work on ADS-CFT in the context of these kind of moduli stabilization scenarios that people try and use to get to kind of semi-realistic mm -hmm. string vacua. So what we're trying to do is to try and really do this and to sort of study these and to, you know, to try and see, to basically say, if, if you trust these as ADS vacua, and then you try and study that from a holographic perspective, you know, what, what do they look like? What properties do they have as, you know, viewed at from, from, a, from a CFT perspective? And, you know, even though there's like an enormous literature of thousands of papers on ADS-CFT and there's an enormous literature of kind of thousands of papers on, you know, how you, in string theory, you do moduli stabilization and with aims of kind of getting these semi-realistic compactifications. And there's only really a few papers like, you know, 
less than five probably on trying to kind of look, look at you know five five to ten maybe you're looking at the kind of the intersection of these and saying you know can you can you test the consistency of these modular stabilization scenarios you know using holographic ideas sorry are you saying that you that this is the only test you've come up with so far yes yeah, so, 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 so what we've done so far is yeah is, is, is asking this question about anomalous dimensions yeah yeah and i'm not saying that like, it's like a definitive thing we're trying to basically really learn what are, what correlates with things being consistent and what not And the, the, another question is, uh, in ADS, it's not that clear to me that uh, negative anomalous dimension is guaranteed by uh, just the gravitational interactions. Do you have a stronger argument for that? I mean, I appreciate the binding energy argument, but you're, you are in ADS space, and I'm not quite sure what that I should use the same intuition. Yeah, I mean, so, so it's known that for some, like for double trace states of kind of various identical operators, that you kind of, you know, you have to have negative anomalous dimensions. So if you build up double trace states using kind of identical operators, then there are kind of CFT arguments that basically prove that the anomalous dimensions have to be negative. Now, this isn't what we've got here. We've got double trace states of, of different, of different op operators. But it doesn't, Yeah, I mean, but maybe the, the fact that these results do exist as kind of like theorems for identical operators or kind of physics theorems for identical operators, you know, gives one hope that there may be some sort of deeper reason that could hold also where you've got where we've got non-identical operators. No, I, I agree that it's yeah. eminently plausible. I'm just wondering if there's if there's anything really solid that one can rely on here. The uh, the relation of uh, of uh, um these anomalous dimensions to energies is well established yes so um but it's it's less obvious to me that they have to be uh, they absolutely yeah no i'm uh, yeah i'm not i'm not making a claim that they absolutely have to, that they absolutely have to be negative yeah it's, it's something it's just something that we kind of observe that it seems that in the theories which we kind of think are consistent they are negative right. yeah and the ones that where we make we kind of make the theory inconsistent then this appears to flip the sign and the ideal thing would be to have something where you could you know have a clear set of conditions in the cft because then you could go the other way which is what we'd really like to do to be able to go the other way to be able to then say well therefore this kind of scenario of modular stabilization is inconsistent because it leads to behavior we know is wrong but at the moment we're just trying to sure. we're trying to kind of see if we can kind of grope our way explore our way to things that appear to be kind of required and appear to be not required Okay, very good. Any other questions? If not, I will stop the recording and we can we can speak more casually. <laughs>